Hello and welcome to Citizens Forum. This is being filmed on Wednesday, September 4th in the beautiful Memorial Arena. I'd like to thank our volunteer crew and Shaw staff for making it all happen. Uh, this first segment is going to be 30 minutes long, longer than usual. Our guest is Elizabeth May, the Green Member of Parliament for Saanich Gulf Islands. Hello, Elizabeth. Hello, Jack. And we've got a lot of things to talk about, and Elizabeth is going to be giving us solutions, I hope, for, for, I mean, obviously where we are right now is not necessarily where we want to be. We can do better, I think, on every front. So let's start with, um, let's start with, well, let's start with democracy. Mm -hmm. Let's start with democracy. There's nothing more important. There really isn't. And, and the Canadian democracy is in crisis. There are some very significant changes being made and distortions of Westminster parliamentary democracy. Uh, they've been creeping along for some time, but they've accelerated under Stephen Harper. And I think it's critical for Canadians to focus on issues of democracy and embrace the solutions so that, you know, inevitably the government's going to change. There'll be a different party in power. And I don't want the same levels of control in the Prime Minister's office to exist for the next Prime Minister. Because regardless of what a Prime Minister's goals are in terms of policies, it's wrong to have a system where all the power is in the hands of one person. The Prime Minister in this country is not uh, elected directly. They do, the Prime Minister's office doesn't exist under our Constitution. It's not, it's not an entity. Uh, it, it's, a, it's an accident of uh, the convenience of successive prime ministers to pull and aggregate to themselves the power, the budget, the people in the prime minister's office running the whole show and in the process undermining parliament. And in our system of government, parliament is supreme. The prime minister is supposed to report to parliament, not the other way around. And, and there are solutions to this, but we, we really have to identify that we have a significant problem. Okay, well, I agree with you. I think I hear the word democracy being mentioned more and more. The media never talks about it, so Canadian citizens really don't know what the specific problems are, but I think everybody knows more and more that there are some problems. The one you mentioned, which is this massive concentration of power in the hands of the Prime Minister federally mm -hmm. and all of the Premiers provincially, yeah. is a serious problem for us. So. If you were Prime Minister mm -hmm. and were going to look into changing that specific thing, where would we start? We have to start with reducing the power of political parties. Organized political parties are also not mentioned in our Constitution. And one of the reasons that the Prime Minister has so much power and that the leader of each of the other parties has so much power is through an accident of history that Elections Canada back in the late 1960s, when for the first time Canadians had the next to the names of the candidates, it wasn't until the late 1960s that they added the name of the party. And when they did that, they said, okay, if we're gonna list the names of the parties next to the name of the candidate, well, how do we know that candidate really represents that party? We'll have the leader sign their nomination papers. We have to take away the requirement that the leader sign the nomination papers because that had the you know law of unintended consequences. That gave leaders of federal political parties a real, you know, cudgel to use to discipline their caucus members and say, if you don't do what I want, I won't sign your nomination papers. So we have to get rid of that. There's no need of it. We can, I've introduced a private member's bill to have the nomination papers signed by the local riding associations or some other combination of yeah. local officials. Uh, once you do that, you know, the prime minister in Canada has more power relative to our system of government than the President of the United States within their system or, or the Prime Minister in the UK. And that's because even though in Westminster parliamentary democracy, which we have in theory in Canada, all the Commonwealth nations, the UK, you think, well, those should be equal, the Prime Minister of Canada, the Prime Minister of the UK. But in Canada, we've appropriated a number of the things that come from the US political system. And one of those things is saying that the leader of the party can only be selected through a convention of their delegates. It sounds more democratic, but what it's meant is that the caucus of elected members of parliament can't oust the prime minister in Canada. That's what gives the prime minister in Canada, relatively speaking, much more power than the UK prime minister. I mean, you'll remember that Margaret Thatcher was deposed by John Major in her own caucus. Yeah, and that's worth, really worth giving some some thought to that in Britain yeah. the caucus 
can remove the party leader, can remove the prime minister. And, and Australia, very recently we had, first we had Kevin Rudd deposed by Julia Gillard without an election, and then Julia Gillard was deposed recently by, by Prime Minister Kevin Rudd of the, of the Australia. in Canada, once you become the prime minister, you are almost de facto a king or queen. That's right. As a matter of fact, uh, after the second prorogation, uh, Professor Emeritus from Queen's University, Ned Franks, said at this point we should refer to Stephen Harper as King Stephen the First of Canada. And this is my point. I don't want a King Justin or a King Tom or, or a Queen me. I don't want the Prime Minister of this country to have a superior role to Parliament. Um, Kevin Page, former Parliamentary Budget Officer, has made this point. The control of the public purse belongs in Parliament. We have to take that back so that Parliament reviews where the spending is, not, you know, sort of have public relations documents float through Parliament while the Prime Minister makes all the decisions. So restoring democracy means also that each member of Parliament should speak for their constituents. They shouldn't just be mere ciphers who do what they're told from a bunch of spin doctors in some back room who are running the party. These are fundamental and important uh, points to protect democracy in Canada. We have not had any changes in legislation to let this happen, other than, as I mentioned, the Elections Act, letting the leaders sign the papers. And I think if Canadians were more aware of what the Westminster parliamentary system is and how it's supposed to work, we could restore it and get members of parliament to represent their constituents uh, to do the work that their, you know, their voters want them to do and not merely show up as representing Team Orange or Team Blue or Team Red. I mean, it's, it's a, it's, and it, that leads, of course, to the combativeness you see in the House of Commons. One other really important change I want to mention for the prescription for saving democracy is to get rid of the first-past-the-post system and move to proportional representation. Um, there are other things I could mention, but th those are the key things. Reducing the power of the Prime Minister's office, enhancing the, pa the, the, the rights and responsibilities of each member of Parliament, getting rid of first past the post. If we could do those things, we'd have a much healthier democracy. And I think you're absolutely right, and I'm going to repeat them if I can. <laughs> One is reduce the power of the, of the party leaders, and especially the Prime Minister. Number two is to, we've got to find a way to make sure our, the people we elect are working for us and are not controlled top down by the party leadership, as is now completely the case. Right. And number three, we've got to change our voting system to something that's more democratic. Yeah. Well, what happens now under first past the post, a lot of cases, because we're used to it, it's the voting system we grew up with, we think it's normal. In fact, only Canada, the United States, and the UK of all modern, par of all modern democracies still use first past the post. Virtually every other, well, all the other modern democracies, enlightened countries, they've all moved to some form of proportional representation. And so, you know, here we are in a system where it's only through first past the post that you could get a perverse result, such as the last election, where, uh, all, you know, it's, it's tragic, I think, that 40% of Canadians didn't vote at all. But of the 60% who voted, 39% voted for conservative candidates in their ridings, and that 39% vote translated into the majority of seats, which in the Canadian context means that the prime, as, as we've seen from the omnibus budget bills, destroying hundreds of years, well, over a hundred years worth of environmental laws, uh, changing our criminal justice system, uh, just absolutely transformational changes to huge areas of public policy, basically suppressing evidence that you used to have evidence made, uh, evidence-based decision making, huge changes created by a minority vote that brings about a majority government. You can't have that result in any voting system except first past the post, which is one of the reasons that I think that if we could get at that change and get to proportional representation, then we'd see voter turnout go up. Because some people say, well, my vote really counts. One of the reasons I think that 40% of Canadians didn't vote is they think, well, my, my vote's not really going to make a difference. So if you live in a riding which always goes liberal or always goes conservative, you think, well, my vote's not really going to matter much, so I'm not going to bother to vote. Once we have proportional representation where every vote counts, I think we'll see Canadians re-engage in the political process, get out and vote for what they believe in. And another, of course, great thing about proportional representation, and I know I'll, I get this question all the time from people about what are we going to do about, quote-unquote, vote splitting? What do we do about the progressive parties all splitting on one side? And it, you know, 
if we have proportional representation, you vote for what you want. You vote out of hope. You vote out of conviction and commitment. You don't vote out of fear. Voting for a party that you don't like as much as the one you really wanted to vote for, but you're more afraid of the other one over there that, that might take power if you don't vote some, you know, sort of hold your nose and vote for the other guy. That kind of voting, I think, uh, voting out of fear, uh, really reduces voter turnout because it's not a good <clears throat> empowering experience. It makes you feel very disempowered to know I couldn't vote for what I really wanted. And in a democracy we should all vote for what we really want, what we believe is right for the country. It's also worth noting that in our system a lot of votes are really devalued. So in the election in which you won a seat as the first green ever elected, I guess, provincially or federally, it required 576,000 votes, I think, to get you elected. Well, of course, th but those are the votes of Greens across the country. Right, right. But, but 576,000 yep. votes elected one Green. That's right. It took about 35,000 votes to elect one Conservative. That's right. So we see that some votes don't count, and some votes count for a lot more. Yeah. And I have to say, the voters of Sandwich Gulf Islands are just phenomenal because what a, you know they took a chance the voters took a chance to to, to vote out a conservative cabinet member yep. and vote in the first elected green and, and when I was elected there was a great deal of conversation in the media pundits that oh well we'll never hear from her again she won't be able to do anything in Ottawa one MP can't make a difference and you know it's it's I've always known one MP could make a difference the same way I know one citizen can make a difference but it, it's uh, knowing the rules of procedure and using them to the maximum extent possible. Uh, I, I know I've contributed much more than media pundits thought I would be able to. But the voters of Sanchez Gulf Islands not only elected me, I think it's also important to note that in uh, the 2011 election, we had the highest voter turnout in the country. We had 75% voter turnout. So when you give people something hopeful, something positive to vote for, people turn out in larger numbers. Well. I really want to thank the voters of Sandwich Gulf <laughs> Islands. I think all Canadians should give a little bit of thanks to Sandwich Gulf Islands for doing it. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, I know, I know a lot of Canadians who feel that way because people who woke up the next, who went to sleep uh, in eastern Canada knowing that Stephen Harper had achieved his majority with a minority of the votes, they didn't see any silver linings in that election. And then they woke up in the morning in eastern Canada and found that voters in Sandwich Gulf Islands we're sending me to Parliament. And, and a lot of the time, I'm the only one on certain issues. And although I, I, my, my number one responsibility, and I mean this, much more than representing the Green Party, my job in Parliament is to represent the voters of Sandwich Gulf Islands. But quite often, I hear from people across the country who say, you know, I really feel like you're my only voice in there. And that's, that's enormously encouraging and humbling to know that there are a lot of Canadians who are counting on me to raise issues they care about because nobody else seems to. All of these issues of democracy that we talked about earlier, how to improve our democracy, um, it's really worth noting that the media never gives any coverage to those issues. And so the people of Canada don't really think about them a lot. It, it's, it's kept on the back burner. And once again, you know, we've got to get our media, and remember our media doesn't work for us, we've got to get the media to start covering these issues. And all we can do is phone them, contact them, you know, tell them, we know what you're up to. And also, that every now and then, I have to say, there's one co columnist for the Globe and Mail nationally who really focuses on democracy in his columns, and that's Lawrence Martin. So another way that Canadians can make a difference in getting the media to cover these issues is to actually, you know, if you're reading the Globe and Mail online or buying it and you see a Lawrence Martin column that talks about the power in the Prime Minister's office and how, how, how corrosive that is to a healthy parliament, writing in to say, really appreciated that column and I need I'd like to see more coverage in the newspapers about these issues of democracy and where you don't see it at all again letting the conventional mainstream media know that these are stories you want to see you want to know how is it that Stephen Harper is able to put through these omnibus bills of hundreds and hundreds of pages and force through bills on time allocation. He, he's broken every record for limiting debates in the House of Commons. We hit, I think it was by the time we adjourned at the end of June, we'd hit 50 5 0 bills with time allocation. In the history of Canada, we've never had more than, well, I think in any session of Parliament, the maximum you'd see would usually be about 10, 50 bills 
uh, with time allocation to limit debate to push them through as fast as possible it, it's not it's 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 anti-democratic well, well, why doesn't our parliament step up and convene yeah. a citizens assembly on democracy in canada and just like we had the citizens assembly on the electoral reform here in bc you know a decade ago our our parliament could convene a citizens assembly on democracy and let's see what that group would come up with we could if the conservative members of parliament were willing to vote for it you put it to them i bet they will i no, think they they're won't. as sick and tired of stephen yeah. harper as we oh, are there's no question in my mind that most of the, the conservative caucus is full of members of parliament who agree with me on many things. As a matter of fact, the only way that I could have been elected Parliamentarian of the Year, which was a vote of all MPs that McLean's Magazine organized, is if many, con if many Conservatives voted for me to be Parliamentarian of the Year. That's a secret ballot. Stephen Harper and, and for that matter, Tom Mulcair, I mean, the, the party leaders tell their members of Parliament how to vote on every single bill, on every single issue. I'll just say that again, because it is disgraceful. Yeah. And, and, you know, I think a lot of people know it, but just, it's... Well, I, it, I have to say, it was one of my biggest surprises on, on election. I knew that there were quite often whipped votes. What I didn't know till I got elected is that every vote, every vote, every time, every other member of parliament is handed a sheet of paper through the whip's office, the, little, the lovely young university students who are pages in the House go around before every vote making sure they're not giving the liberal how to vote sheet to an NDP -er or the NDP how to vote sheet accidentally somebody else. They go through the House and they put the sheets of paper on every desk. It says vote yes, vote no, vote yes, vote no, Bloc Québécois, vote oui, vote non. I mean, every single MP except the ones who sit as independents. I sit as a member of Parliament for the Green Party. Uh, one time, one of my colleagues in another party, as he was looking at his voting instructions, turned around and said to me, gee, Elizabeth, how do you know how to vote? I mean, they all regard it as awful that they don't get to vote for what they think is the right vote on that bill, given what their constituents want. Every time, every vote. So if we were to put forward a motion, let's have a citizens' assembly, let's examine parliamentary democracy, unless Stephen Harper told them it was okay with him for them to vote for that, they would be punished if they voted for it, and it wouldn't pass. I mean, I've seen it happen far too often on things where I know conservatives wanted to vote a certain way. I mean, heck, after I got elected, one of the first votes that we had in the House was on uh, an NDP motion put forward by my friend Pat Martin from Winnipeg that to, to say that asbestos is a hazardous material and Canada should, under the Rotterdam Convention, agree to having it listed as a hazardous material. I watched conservatives stand up and vote that asbestos was safe. They knew it wasn't. I mean, it's asbestos. We've, it's banned everywhere. It's being pulled out of the Parliament of Canada at a cost of uh, you know hundreds of millions of dollars. And They're, they had to vote that because they Stephen were told, told to vote that asbestos was safe and to defeat the NDP motion. I mean, I've, I've seen it happen far too often. I one one of my friends in the Conservative caucus came over to me after the asbestos vote and said, I'm going to go home now and have a shower because I've never felt so dirty in my life. I mean, it's heartbreaking to watch good people, and I would say that 95% plus of the MPs that I work with in the House of Commons of all parties are good people because they've chosen to do something in public service. And often for a lot of them, it's a rude awakening once they're elected to find that their job is to sit down when their leader tells them to sit down, shut up when their leader tells them to shut up, and read the cue card when they're told to read it. Uh, it's disillusioning, but they don't, you know, if, if they were, it, it would take all of them standing up to it bravely to defeat the power that a leader has over the party caucus. I should mention that in the Green Party, if I were going to deny someone their the right to run, I'd need the support of the federal council, which really runs the party. So we're organized as a grassroots party, and as leader, I don't have the powers that leaders of other parties have, and I'm really glad of that because we I have to be grassroots. I think that's very important then. So in other words, that power can be taken away from the leader. The power to sign the paper of every member of parliament, the leader has to do that yes. or they can't run for the party, which means their career is over. It's up to us Canadians to take that power away from, not from Stephen Harper, but from, from the Prime leader. Minister, yeah, from, from every all leader. the party leaders. Party leaders, and again, just I can't say it too often, I mean, I think if we could reinvent democracy in Canada, I wouldn't have invented political parties at all. 
right? They exist, we're not going to get rid of them, but we need to restrict the power of political parties because as it's become excessive, and I, I mentioned another academic a moment ago, but one of my favorite academics on these topics, if people want to look up his writings, is another professor emeritus, University of Toronto professor Peter Russell. And he's pointed out very clearly that the threat to democracy, he wrote a book called um, Two Cheers, for minority government. It's a really good little volume that if you don't know a lot about how Westminster parliamentary democracy works, this is a great little primer. But he pointed out, you know, if it, the, it's the power of well-organized, well-financed political parties that's a threat to Westminster parliamentary democracy. And what it means is that, you know, in the I worked in the Mulroney government years ago. Once the elections were over, there was a sense that, okay, the war, you know, kind of hostilities are over. We're now working in, we're working together, so there'd be a lot of cooperation between the NDP, the Liberals, the Progressive Conservatives. We would never have gotten Guayahanas National Park without cooperation across party lines. It was like this, you know, cessation of hostilities. Our job now is to govern, and we did it quite often across party lines cooperatively. What's happened since the 1980s to now? is that the, the, the hostilities don't cease. It, and, and a lot of this is due to Stephen Harper's brand of conservatism, bringing on some of the sort of uh, more uh, take no prisoners attitudes and, and concepts from the Tea Party Republican approach, attack ads all the time. Attack ads when we're not even in an election period. Stephen Harper's introduced that into our political culture. We should absolutely get rid of that. But it, it's what it means is that you never have a moment when the different parties don't feel that they're at war with each other instead of doing the people's business. Well, you know, I was actually very proud of Parliament just this last week, but of course not the Canadian Parliament, <laughs> which, which is, I think, just a mess, but the British Parliament yeah. that stood up to Mr. Cameron, the Prime Minister, and told him that no, much as you want to go into Syria with the Americans, it's not going to happen. And Mr. Cameron was forced to listen to Parliament. Yes. In Canada, that kind, it, I believe that about 30 Conservative members of Parliament voted against yes. their own party's dictate. I mean, it was wonderful. I felt like running the British flag up outside the house <laughs> if, if I had a flag. Well, I mean, this is what I, you know, uh, all of the opposition party leaders, uh, Mr. Mulcair, Mr. Trudeau, and myself, have called for the Prime Minister to reconvene Parliament so we can discuss the, the issue of the crisis in Syria. Uh, I certainly would like to have it discussed in the House of Commons. I spoke with John Baird just last week about this, uh, and his, he was basically saying, look, we're not going to go to war in Syria, so we don't need to reconvene the House. So I said, well, look, we should be doing something. There's a humanitarian crisis here. It's been going on for years. Uh, innocent people are being slaughtered in Syria. I have a lot of Syrian, uh, Canadian constituents where I've been working with families and very, very attuned and, and horrified and by also, the human suffering. And also, how does that bunch dare to support the American position when I'm sure the people of Canada don't? Yeah, exactly. So, we should have a discussion. of course, Parliament should be recalled, but instead it's prorogued. Yes. And I'd like to know, how can the Prime Minister prorogue Parliament without, if this is a parliamentary democracy where Parliament is supreme, the Prime Minister should not be able to prorogue Parliament without the consent of the Parliament. It's too dangerous yeah. to allow it. Well, in the past, I mean, there are legitimate prorogations, yes. and I would say that the, the first two times that Stephen Harper prorogued the House of Commons were unconstitutional. One of the odd things about our system is that it can be unconstitutional without being illegal. So it, when he went to the Governor General, in, uh, to Mikhail Jean in the fall of 2008 and prorogued Parliament to avoid a confidence vote he knew he was going to lose. That's outrageous. The second time, you know, sort of casually on New Year's Eve, phoning the Governor General to say, well, I want to prorogue Parliament because I, I want to recalibrate. And he was a minority leader yes. at that time. Now, what's happened now is I have to say, right now, this is the third prorogation under Stephen Harper. If it, if, if it had been his first one, it wouldn't have been controversial because this is more normally what prime ministers do is go to the governor general and say, I want a new speech from the throne. Uh, I've run out my legislative agenda. I mean, we were sitting from May 20th till the end of June okay. with adjournment at midnight every night. And as I mentioned, time allocation, all the debates were time. So would. Let's, let's say this one is okay this then, one but still would, two that are, you believe are unconstitutional. unconstitutional. And yeah. there's, the country should be up in arms. The media yes. really put a clamp down on it. and, and yeah. So this is the disaster that our, our democracy and is And another in. thing, of course, is that Stephen Harper, having done it twice, 
opened the door to the Premier of Ontario doing it. Now, I mean, I, obviously, I think on terms of policies, I, I would put Dalton McGuinty in the same boat as Stephen Harper. But as you mentioned earlier, once you start a accumulating exactly. power in the hands of the Prime Minister, the premiers are doing this too. We've seen the changes that the deputy ministers of various government departments no longer report through their minister. They report to the, to the premier's offices. So this is, a, this is a very large problem that we have where the functioning, healthy Westminster system in which each MLA and each member of parliament is supposed to represent their constituents and make a difference in their legislature and parliament is being distorted into one person rule where premiers and prime ministers call the, the whole show. And it's up to us. We've got yeah. to fix it. We've got let's, to fix let's it. Let's move away from that and to um, the situation in Fukushima, oh, which yeah. is now so disastrous that even the media is starting to report on it. Maybe you can just tell people what's going on. Well, TEPCO, the private sector company that built the reactors in Fukushima, was trusted by the Japanese government to be able to deal with the ongoing disaster after the tsunami. And now the Japanese government has realized that was a mistake. They've been leaking radioactive water into the groundwater. Some has reached the oceans. Um, the Green Party is the only party that's actually spoken to this issue. We have, I, I wrote John Baird, as well as the Minister for Health and the Minister responsible for Agriculture and Fisheries to suggest a couple things. One is that on an international basis, we should be offering whatever assistance we can to Japan. This is going to be an ongoing issue. It's going to require containment. They're talking about building uh, an ice it. wall to try it. to it's... contain the, yeah, to try to keep the water from reaching the sea. They're talking about actually freezing the coastline. Uh, this is very, very difficult technologically, and we don't want radioactive materials reaching uh, the, 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 well, the fisheries that is move it, between across the Pacific. Is it, uh, is it true Pacific. that the government of Canada used to do radiation testing along the coast and has stopped now? That's what, that's absolutely, and this is one of the things, we, we had radiation testing happening at the time the Fukushima disaster first happened, but we weren't reporting the numbers we were getting, whereas the U.S. government was both testing and reporting. I have called them to improve the uh, access to information and the testing, because Canadians need to know, we need to be watchful. There, there's nothing to, you know, at this point I wouldn't panic about seafood from the Pacific, but we need to monitor and we need to report on what we're finding. Uh, meanwhile, in terms of uh, nuclear reactors around the world, other countries are moving away from nuclear, are closing reactors because we realize it's, it's a very unforgiving technology. If it makes, if you have a, if you have a disaster, uh, it's a very, very large scale disaster. Elizabeth, I think we've got two minutes left. Mm. So um, I think we've covered the most important issue, which is democracy. I think if we could improve our democracy, I think everything would get a little we bit have better. to address the climate crisis. I have to say that, the, the, and I'm working on a new book right now that will come out next fall, on the democracy crisis and the ways in which the failures to address what's wrong with a healthy, you know, the, our lack of a healthy democracy in Canada compromises our ability to address the climate crisis, which is by far the biggest challenge for our kids' future. It's a security threat. It's, yes, it's an environmental threat, but it's primarily a threat to uh, human civilization's survival. And we're allowing greenhouse gases to continue to go through the roof. We don't have an effective climate plan. We have a piecemeal approach. And basically, I think, you know, Stephen Harper had canceled all previous climate action plans that were put in place by previous governments. And despite a lot of discussion of what he is going to do, uh, he hasn't acted. And in fact, everything that Stephen Harper has done has been to sabotage global progress towards international treaties to limit greenhouse gases. So that's a key area. You know, in, in terms of the economy, we can do a lot better in a prosperous economy that's built on a low carbon future. Many more, you know, if we diversify our energy sources, if we're looking at what's possible with renewables, if we improve our energy efficiency so we waste less, we will be a healthier, more prosperous economy with more jobs. So we've got to get over this jobs versus the economy nonsense that we hear from Mr. Harper. Because it's not jobs versus the economy or jobs versus the environment. It's, it's profit versus both jobs and the environment. That's right. And, it's, and actually, we can also make profits that are healthy while yeah, protecting the yeah. environment. It just depends on how, you know, there's a wonderful book called The Ecology of Commerce. It's been out for many years, but it was written by Paul Hawken, who was a successful CEO. And he wrote, you know, he was running a natural foods company, a big one, Erewhon Natural Foods. And he was 
very successful. He said he realized that as good as his company was, the business model they were, they were the, the, the treadmill he was on was going to continue to hurt the environment. He said he realized that it wasn't that CEOs of industry wake up in the morning and think, what can I do to hurt the environment? It is he said what, what it we is. have is that we have, a, we have a design problem. We're going to have to stop right there. That we can change the design. It's a human construct. So th those are all hopeful messages. You want to know about solutions. There's a lot of solutions out there. And that's, I think, the most important thing. We can change the design of Canada, and we have to do it because disaster awaits us if we don't. Elizabeth May, thank you very much. Thank you, and Jack. Great to be here. Thanks for watching this segment of Citizens Forum.